Bill Gross, who I've known for an awfully long time. In fact, I don't know if you even remember when you once tried to hire me. Remember that? <laughs> uh, that, was, uh, that, that was probably my mistake. But anyway, um, as it says in your bio, you're an incurable entrepreneur. You've been starting businesses since you were 15, started over 100 companies, over 45 exits. I mean, honestly, there aren't many people like this in the world. And you, it is the world's idea lab, which you run in Pasadena, started in 1996, the longest running technology incubator in the world. Okay. And you have pivoted to climate. All right. So why have you pivoted to climate? And why you, did you want us to call this session, Why Tech Can Solve Climate Change? Well, um, thank you for having me, David. Thank you for those kind compliments. Uh, Suzanne, that was great what you presented. Um, I really feel that um, you inspired me a lot, and that was some of my original inspiration on climate, that renewable energy is freedom energy. It can give access to people all over the planet, and it can end the geological lottery, people who just so happen to have something under the ground where they lived. And I remember when I was growing up, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, I was a teenager, <laughs> And we had the 1973 oil embargo. Hmm. And here I saw there's a country in the world that can cut off our fossil fuels. And we had to wait. I remember we could only buy $5 of ration gasoline every other day from the gas stations. And that got me really, really inspired about renewable energy and how could we have some other alternative source that everybody could have access to. So I started a number of internet companies, as you know. And um, then I really saw from, from the success of those, I could invest that in this climate area. And I was way too early. I started this in 2000, 2001, 2002, and I thought it would take a few years. It took 20. Uh, but the world is ready for this now, and the world needs this so badly. And it's not only the most important thing we can do for the planet, it's the biggest business opportunity in history. It's bigger than the Industrial Revolution. This energy transition is so, so large. And I don't think people realize how much we rely on energy. It's, it's everything. It's our comfort. It's convenience, it's our safety, it's our GDP, and yet we're getting all of it from burning stuff. So if we can make it renewable from sun, wind, and nuclear, that is just a game changer for civilization. The odds that we're alive in this 10 year period when we have to make this transition or this 20 year period where we have to make this, it's just exciting and terrifying, as you know, because of all the challenges we have, but it's really motivating to me to work on this. Well, I know you're an intrinsic optimist. And so you believe we can do it if we put our shoulders to the wheel. I believe we can do it because uh, of technology. So uh, my, my punchline is Moore's law is our secret weapon. And I say that because of all the commodities that you look at or anything that you look at over history, they're always fluctuating, whether it's coffee or beef or steel, or like right now, nickel is going through the roof. But the one thing that's going down absolutely continuously is the cost of computing power. And you could take a $50 million Cray computer from 1984, and you can buy that amount of compute power today for four cents. It's wow. four cents in a Sony PlayStation. It's not even a Cray computer, it's just a PlayStation. You can buy it for four cents. So when you have something which is that powerful and that cheap, if we can leverage more of that, more, more bytes, more bits, and fewer atoms, that's how I think we compete with fossil fuels. So we've heard about it today. Many, many people using compute power, compute power to do analysis of where things are happening in the world around us from satellite imagery, compute power to use AI and machine learning, how to redesign to trees, even, yeah. Everything. Yeah. So a compute power is this gift we've been given that we need to take advantage of to compete with this stuff that we dig out of the ground and burn. And, and when you think back from all of civilization, at first we got all of our energy from our muscles, muscles and plants. And then we discovered that we could burn things. So the first, the first revolution was the biology revolution. You know, our muscles moved us around. Then we discovered we could burn things. That was the chemistry revolution, burning everything in sight. This new physics revolution is where we have to go. Physics has to be the final solution to this problem. And it's basically using every bit of technology we have. Super well said, <laughs> not surprisingly. Well, let's look at what you're working on, because I know we have a couple of quick slides. So the middle button, you get that? OK. So just tell us about the, especially the three companies that you have created, one of which, this is the one you're CEO of, right? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so uh, first of all, I'd say we need 1,000 shots on goal. Uh, Bill Gates said it well earlier in the, in, in the day. We need everything. There's no, there's no single solution that's going to solve everything. I'm working on three particular ones, but we need thousands of things. And I would love to talk to people about other ideas they have because I'd love to contribute any way I can on some of those other thousands of things that we need. This particular one, Heliogen, is concentrated solar. Uh, I don't think people realize how much energy is used in heavy industry 
for cement, for mining, for steel making, it's 35% of all of emissions. So we're working on a solution to concentrate solar energy, like a huge magnifying glass. You see here is a picture of a field of mirrors that are concentrating sunlight up to a single tower. Uh, there's the mirror field. Those are 400 mirrors that are all computer controlled, pointing up to that tower. And that hot spot up at the top there gets to 1,000 degrees centigrade. And you can see two little cameras above that hot spot. Those cameras are where we're using technology. We're using computer vision to look at the field of mirrors continuously and in real time adjust all of them to make them point perfectly right at that spot. It's called a closed loop system, but it's one of the examples of using Moore's law to try and down, drive down the price, drive up the temperature, drive down the price. So what do we use this for? Steel companies need this for steel making. Mining companies need this to make steam for mining all their minerals. Right now they burn the dirtiest crap to get that heat. We can give them that heat with zero carbon from the sun. So this is one example of a way to use computation, Moore's law, drive down the cost, drive up the temperatures, and this is distributed. This can be located right on a customer sites. So we're talking to mining companies, steel companies. We just announced a deal with a large company in Australia, Woodside Energy, a large oil and gas producer, but they want to switch away from that to renewables by using technology like this. Wow, good, good start. So there's one, there's one. Another one, uh, energy This storage. one is really cool. <laughs> uh, uh, energy storage. <sighs> you, you heard about this, everybody's working on batteries. The, um, a breakthrough happened in 2018. 2018 was the first time in all of human history where we can make electrons from the sun and the wind cheaper than burning things. The problem is they're intermittent. They only happen when the sun's shining or the wind's blowing. So we need a way to store that energy. Of course, batteries are a great way to do, do that. That's a chemical form of storage. Another form of storage that people have used for a very long time is pumped hydroelectric, pumping water up a mountain, storing that energy with potential energy and letting the water flow back down. It's a really, really cost-effective and valuable method to store energy. The problem is you can't put it everywhere. You need a mountain. You need two mountains. You need a mountain with a reservoir at the top and at the bottom. So we tried to make an artificial dam or an artificial mountain by building a crane, a computer controlled crane that would lift up blocks. Those are 35 ton blocks of dirt. It would lift up those blocks, stack them, and then store the energy with potential energy of a stack of dirt, basically, not needing a mountain. And by using, again, computer vision and automation and synchronization of how this moves, we can build up a system. You can see how large the blocks are. They're 35 tons. They're one meter by two meters by four meters. And now we're building a large thing called a resiliency center. We built that first crane that was built in Switzerland. And now we're building a building that looks like this that will store one gigawatt hour. It's basically a series of elevators lifting up mass, but all in synchrony to store the energy perfectly and release it perfectly. We're really excited about this because we need large scale energy storage to take renewables and make them available all through the day and even seasonal storage that you can do by storing a lot of energy at height. This building is 300 meters by 300 meters by 100 meters, but it stores a gigawatt hour. So it has its own solar supply for the daytime. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so imagine you see a wind farm in the background or there could be a PV, PV farm near, yeah. nearby. That charges it up when those assets are operating but then you can discharge it at any time you like. And it's about 90% round trip efficiency. So it's as good as batteries for putting the energy in and out, but you don't need any lithium and you have no rare earth materials and it's um, re readily available to scale almost anywhere on earth. And one of the things you said to me about it, which I thought was really important is it may cost quite a bit to build, but once it's built, it costs almost nothing to operate. Yes, right? and, and this can run for 20, 30, maybe even 50 years because it's really, really simple technology. So very, very high reliability. There's no degradation like there would be with a battery. Every time you cycle it, it doesn't lose anything. Yeah. So really excited about this technology. Very original. And then the last thing, carbon capture. There's many people working on carbon capture around the world. We need direct air capture. It's so exciting that Microsoft is sponsoring this, Stripe sponsoring this, other people sponsoring this. The whole trick here is drive down the price so it's low enough. And then when there's someday a cost of carbon, which is rising on the exchanges right now, and when we can beat the price on the exchange, then this can scale very large. And the unique thing that we're doing is building a modular carbon capture solution that can be put anywhere. It can be delivered on a truck. It can be powered by renewable energy, powered by solar. In fact, we'll probably partner with Heligen to get the solar energy to power this. And if we can take CO2 out of the atmosphere at a cost-effective price, I want everybody to be working on things like this, not, not this exact me methodology, but we need many, many efforts to go backwards in time. I, I, I think of it from this way. When I was born, when I was first excited about this, uh, there were 315 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now there's more than 415. So it went up 100 in my lifetime. So not only do we have to get to zero CO2 emissions from all of our energy needs, which is possible with technology, we have to go backwards in time if we want to give 
the same earth that I inherited to my children and grandchildren. So we have to actually take out CO2 from the atmosphere to go back from 415 down to 315. So that's why we need carbon capture as well. So it, all these different things are needed as part of the overall solution. Now, this is your newest company and the, the least far along yes. as a business. Now, is that actually a photograph or a computer graphic? That's a computer rendering. We'll yeah. be rolling this out next year. Okay, but the thing, I also wanted you to quickly tell your story about Mark Benioff and this company, could you mind? Um, I was at um, uh, Davos a few years ago, and Mark was talking on a panel about uh, keeping the oceans cleaner and really removing pollution from the oceans. And I was really inspired by that, and it got me thinking about the atmosphere and how we're polluting our atmosphere. You heard earlier about that thin peel on the apple is our, our atmosphere. Well, we're throwing so much trash up into that atmosphere. It's, it's like we're polluting the oceans, except we just don't see it because it's invisible. I think if CO2 were visible, we would be a lot, we would move, have moved a lot faster. Mm. But uh, I don't think everybody realizes, uh, everybody on earth makes about one pound of trash per day. So 8 billion people, 8 billion pounds of trash go into landfills. But everybody on Earth makes about 31 pounds of CO2 trash up into the atmosphere. We put 31 times as much into. I mean, the just atmosphere. by breathing? No, no, by, by the by the burning of the fuels that we use. By by the, by the burning. Okay. By, by the bur burning of the fuels that each of us uses, we're putting 31 pounds of trash up into the atmosphere. Yeah, I'm not a scientist. Go on. Yeah. So, so, I, so I, I reached out to Mark and I said, Mark, you know what you're doing on the oceans is incredible. I think we need to do something for the atmosphere too. I have an idea for a solar-powered CO2 removal system. Would you like to invest in something like that? He said, I'm in, like immediately. Just, just this is like that. on the phone, <laughs> leaving Davos on the bus or whatever. Just, just from yeah. that. So he said, what do you need to do an experiment for the first year? Done. So, so uh, he was our first investor in this company. We built a lab scale prototype, some Caltech scientists right in Pasadena. We proved that this idea could work, You know, this particular method that we're using. And now we're scaling the company. We've raised additional financing. We have great investors alongside of us. Fantastic CEO, Adrian Corliss running the company. But I, I love the idea that the world cares about this now and is investing. And that, that's a big change. So when I first came to your Fortune Brainstorm conference and got excited about this in 2001, nobody wanted to invest. But now there's angel investors, there's public market investors, there's individual investors, there's corporate investors. I think corporations are actually making a huge lead, making up for what governments aren't doing. And I hope more people uh, emulate what Microsoft is doing to really move this along. Really cool. Uh, who has a question for Bill? Anybody? Okay, can we get the mic up here? Right over here? Sorry, just give us one second. Thank you so uh, you much, know, David, for putting on this conference. No, you know what I love? You're making so much awareness about this, it's really- You know what I love is how fast you talk, because <laughs> we can get a lot out of you in a short time. It's really good. You can tell I'm a little excited about no, it. No, I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> That's one of the great things about you. Okay, please. Hi, um, my name's Deep, Deep Sani, and about 15 years ago, I set up an innovation hub between Berkeley and Stanford oh. on clean tech. <laughs> before clean tech was profitable. Yes, yes, so now I'm back time. again. Um, very interesting idea what you're doing with the, the vault, energy yeah. vault. What do you see is the impediment for that to take over like battery storage? Like in Spain, there's a lot of solar going on. There's a, there's a lot of solar happening here in the Southwest of the United States, but um, you know, storage is a big issue with solar and with wind. And how do you be able to get folks off of these other fossil fuel burning um, uh, sources of energy. Well, one, Thank I'd you. say we need every kind of storage. We need uh, chemical storage. So we will have a need for batteries. Batteries are compact. Obviously, batteries are great for transportation, for automotive. Nothing like this would ever work for automotive. Uh, we need thermal storage. Heliogen's working on thermal storage. And we need uh, mechanical storage, which is gravity storage. I don't think there's any impediment. I think that we just have rolled this out and there's global demand like crazy. We are racing to scale to meet that demand. But fortunately, the capital markets are allowing that, which is really a big change from the past. Really cool. Anybody else? Oh, oh there's a very eager hand. Okay. Uh, and then we get, we we'll, may have time for two, but they have to be really fast because we're short on time. Thank you, John. Oh, the, the mics are coming at you right and left. Okay. Uh, give, hey, maybe give the other one to this person right back there, John, right? See you back there. Hi, Bill. Dave Calloway from Calloway Climate Insights. Nice hey. to see you. Hello, David. Um, based on the carbon capture technology that you're developing and that you see from the other several hundred companies yep. out there working on it, when do you think, as an optimist, we could estimate that costs will come down enough to cross? Yes. So right prices. now, the carbon prices on the European exchange have crossed 60, I think recently, $80 per ton, 80 euros per ton, so almost $100. 
I think we will beat $100 by the end of this decade. I would like it to be sooner, but we really have to. And um, I think there's so much money going into it and so much innovation. And again, I think technology is the answer. I think every little bit of AI-based optimization, you have to use, all, all of these technologies need materials. They need steel, they need cement, they need materials to build the structures. We need to use fewer of those atoms to be able to compete. And the way we do that is with more bytes, more software. Very cool. Real quick, yes. Hi, I'm Catherine Chan from X the Moonshot Factory. Um, so in a similar business of innovation with technology, but very curious, I guess, short of the market development and formation that needs to be happening outside of Idea Labs, how do you identify entrepreneurs and help them succeed in creating technologies that can scale in very compressed timeframes? Oh boy, you're just trying to make- He's an expert at that. Convert 25 years of experience, pains and successes into a, a short answer. I would love to follow up with you afterwards, but I, I would say, Right now, the entrepreneurs are being attracted because of the mission-driven nature of this. We're finding that especially youth, but everybody cares about this so much more. I just heard, I heard this from VJ last night that at MIT, a professor is seeing that 50% of the incoming class wants to work on something related to climate, and the other 50% wants to work on robotics and AI, but apply to climate. So every, <laughs> every, okay. everybody cares about this right now, which is so great. <laughs> Like that's a change in the world that has happened. And I thank Greta and everyone else who has uh, championed that to make everybody aware of that and, and care about it. Uh, but I'll talk to you more about the other lessons learned separately afterwards. Well, we've but, got to wrap, but I want to say we have a, a breakout called Energy for a Peaceful Planet, which Bill will be on, which Vijay from The Economist, who we mentioned is moderating, which will be in one of those rooms at, at the breakout at 2.15, along with AJ, who was just on stage, is also on that. Uh, and Suzanne, so, uh, and, and Michael Dunn, who's gonna be here a little bit later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, you are awesome. <laughs>